Good afternoon. My name is Paul Conway and I serve as the co-chair of the Global Summit and thank you for joining this session. This session is entitled Emerging Research with Global Implications, Advancements Toward the Artificial Organs, or in this case particularly, Artificial Implantable and Wearable Kidneys. Our first guest comes to us from the American Society of Nephrology, a longtime AAKP ally, Dr. Mark Lin, who serves as the Vice President of Research, Discovery, and Innovation at ASN. He also heads up the oversight of the project called Kidney X, which is a prize competition in the kidney space, which since its founding in 2018 has awarded 50 innovators with prizes for unique contributions in the areas of implantable dialysis devices, dialysis infection pre prevention, and other discoveries that have profound implications, not just for patients, but also for their families, the research community, and the country. Mark is a really dynamic leader. He has a great background in the federal government where he has overseen major research programs and major projects. He's a great patient advocate, a good friend of AAKP, and a really solid person in the areas of science and the production of complex solutions. Mark, go right ahead. Hi, my name is Mark Lim. I'm the Vice President of Research Discovery and Innovation at the American Society of Nephrology. I uh, really want to thank AAKP for this opportunity to present at the third annual Global Summit, um, really to share um, both where Kidney X has gone and, and where we're planning to take Kidney X with a goal of uh, continuing to catalyze really innovations uh, so that we have more options for people with kidney diseases. Um, I'll be um, doing most of the presentation, but uh, much of this presentation is on behalf of also Molly O'Neill, one of my colleagues who won't be able to join us today, uh, who's a Kidney X coordinator. In, in terms of disclosures, uh, re, uh, neither both of us are full-time employees of ASN. Uh, Molly doesn't have any disclosures to, uh, to make. Um, I'm a non-paid voting member of the Scientific Advisory Board um, for the organization listed there. Particularly for this audience, uh, you know, it really goes without saying why innovation is needed for people with kidney diseases. Um, I think the need for innovation was even more amplified uh, during the COVID pandemic in which uh, really uh, our patient community uh, needed more innovations, uh, both those on dialysis, uh, those are uh, transplant recipients. So there's just definitely an opportunity uh, for innovation, but there's also a, an increased need for different types of innovative tools, innovative drugs, uh, innovative diagnostics. Fortunately, we've actually seen a, a wealth of innovations starting to come into the marketplace. Uh, many of them are becoming uh, tools that are available to both clinicians and to patients, uh, both uh, from, on, you can see on the left, from precision medicine, um, both looking at different drugs that have recently approved um, by the FDA, um, drugs that are also in the pipeline, as well as new diagnostics. Um, on the right, you can also see just really a lot of innovations happening on the devices side, primarily for the ability of uh, on kidney replacement therapy, um, where it's either portable dialysis, um, safer ways of doing dialysis, which you can see in the center, um, or even just the goal of actually having an artificial kidney. Um, these are just some of the many examples of where innovations are really starting to come uh, and become more available to people with kidney diseases. <clears throat> but unfortunately, if you look across the, in, um, in terms of the investment landscape, uh, the kidney ends up being still kind of low compared to other disease areas. Uh, this is data that was uh, uh, kind of culled together off of two different uh, venture capital um, databases. And um, we linked both the, what you could use as renal or kidney health to see what's in there. Um, and you can see it's still quite low whether it's renal kidney health are combined uh, you know, over the years, even though you do see a slight increase, uh, it still does fall behind other disease areas. So for this reason alone, the Kidney X, also known as a Kidney Innovation Accelerator, uh, was started a couple of years ago uh, as a public-private partnership between the US Department of Health and Human Services and ASN, really to not just uh, spur innovation, but really accelerate it in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of kidney diseases. Uh, Kidney X does this really kind of from three different pillars. <clears throat> One is we try to identify those innovations that have the greatest unmet need for people with kidney diseases, and we keep focused on that uh, and being able to try to fill that unmet need. Um, we take in kind of a, a partnership approach uh, then to also uh, kind of bring together networks and experts 
uh, both through ASN and as well as with our other uh, partnering organizations. Um, and our third role is really to support those entrepreneurs along a pathway to the kidney patient, really all with the goal to sustain a, a robust marketplace uh, so that innovations continue to come and become available uh, to people with kidney diseases. So we take it from kind of from two different angles. One is looking at the kidney innovation as kind of an ecosystem. One is where we can take innovations that may have even been used in other areas such as cancer or cardiology and try to steer them towards those unmet needs that are identified. Um, the second one is, you know, when you have innovators ready within this ecosystem, we want them to continue innovating, uh, really focused on people with kidney diseases. And that's really within the role of what Kidney X does in addition to its other partners such as NIH and others. Um, the second angle is to try to figure out a way and it's to de-risk kidney innovations. Um, and of course, these two aren't are necessarily separate pathways, um, but they're obviously linked. Uh, one is to address technical challenges, regulatory questions, and, and that's where we bring together scientists, um, our partners at NIH, our partners at FDA, our partners at CMS, as well as other global um, regulatory agencies, and as well as uh, experts, uh, to come together and see if we could start to anticipate where there may be regulatory science challenges, and see if there's opportunities to bring the community to try to address them kind of proactively before the the innovators kind of hit that hit that potential bottleneck. Um, the second one is really just by creating some more stability um, in the kidney innovation space is really to just get investors as well as potentially companies uh, really excited about being involved and, and participating, contributing to the, the kidney innovation sphere. <clears throat> um, the first one, the addressing technical challenges, regulatory questions is something that uh, at least for now, uh, one way we're addressing it is through the Kidney Health Initiative, which I'll explain in the next slide. So as Ed mentioned before, the Kidney Health Initiative is another public partnership between ASN, uh, the US FDA, and about 120 different organizations focused on kidney innovations. Um, really, the focus is to address regulatory uh, science issues that could go anywhere from endpoint measurements uh, where there might be a lack of clarity or consensus on how do you measure both safety and efficacy of different novel tools or novel drugs. Um, we also incorporate uh, through the Kidney Health Initiative's Patient Family Partnership Council um, a couple of different efforts to look at patient reported outcome measurements um, and make sure that those are also available to the community so that they can use those as part of their trial design or part of the research. Uh, one of the tools that, have, that has come out in 2018 is what we call the Technology Roadmap for Innovative Approaches for Renal Replacement Therapy. Um, that is kind of predicting what patients and clinicians would need for kidney replacement therapy, both from a technology angle, um, and then trying to incorporate, since we have the chance to, also patient preferences. And you can see that there's kind of in, in this box on the right, both what we were able to work with these groups to identify and prioritize were um, it, different ways that patients want to see improvement in their quality of life. And it's, it's a mix of the different technological approaches, whether it's enhancing dialysis, whether it's really shifting to portability, wearability, and you can see kind of it goes on to eventually, you know, an artificial kidney, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit more. Um, the technology roadmap is something that really kind of sets a foundation for how we're going to monitor uh, what happens in the future and also guide the innovator community uh, along that roadmap so that both patients, regulators, researchers, um, clinicians kind of see the progress of, uh, of technology development and innovation. Uh, another good example of where Kidney X was trying to get more information in terms of what are the un most unmet needs is what happened just last year with COVID uh, and it's still kind of continuing on this year. Um, ASN convened a panel in collaboration with a lot of its federal partners, which you see on the right, um, as well as um, a couple of the dialysis and kidney care facilities uh, to look at what was, what was happening during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so this, is, this uh, workshop was held in July of last year. Um, and some of the example findings, recommendations uh, are listed there, which are relevant to like needs for innovation. One was um, hospitals estimated that there was about a 25% increase in the need for dialysis machines, uh, just to make sure, uh, based on what happened during the first wave and what they're anticipating in terms of future waves of the pandemic. 
Um, one thing that's kind of repeated throughout the report, which is available on ASN's website, is that logistics for managing both people, the machines, the disposables and consumables was, was a significant challenge. Um, and there was a big call out for both supply chain, uh, human resource inventory management systems, uh, particularly since a lot of staff were also reluctant uh, to remain in these COVID-19 positive rooms. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of opportunity here for innovations and that's something that we um, helped support in terms of, uh, or helped address in terms of uh, the one of our prizes. Uh, so this is an example of uh, where, where we've gone up to this date. Um, you can see from 2018, that was where our uh, roadmap was, was published. And to support what was uh, described in the roadmap, we had two different what we call redesigned dialysis prizes. Uh, you can see some of the winners that are on the right. Um, we also had a, what we call the patient innovator challenge to see, you know, what are the different patient solutions. And you can see also some of the examples, again, kind of on the map on the right. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we saw an opportunity where we could look at innovations coming from patients as well as the care facilities to help support the safety and the resiliency of kidney care during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we had 15 prize winners that were just recently announced a couple months ago. Uh, again, there's some examples to the right. Um, and more recently, we just closed the submissions for our first phase of what we're calling the Artificial Kidney Prize. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that over the next uh, couple of slides. The artificial kidney is something that we see is inevitable as, as a technological solution um, where, you know, basically, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at replicating the functioning kidney. Uh, we do know that, you know, at-home dialysis is increasingly becoming a viable option and, you know, particularly reinforced during COVID, it's necessary for patients to make sure that they're maintaining uh, their kidney care. Um, redesigned dialysis phase one and two addressed it. Uh, we're looking much more further down the line at the artificial kidney, which could be, you could kind of think in concept of both a wearable or an implantable concept that, um, and we're keeping open in terms of the uh, multiple approaches that could be used, you know, coming from the science and technology uh, folks, whether it's an engineering or regenerative medicine, xenotransplant, or even just kind of keeping it open to, you know, what are areas that are just haven't been conceived yet, knowing that we, we have some time uh, to see if those are solutions that can get us there. <clears throat> the one thing that's very different also in terms of mindset is that the artificial kidney, it, it requires a patient-centered design, um, and we are both aligned to our past roadmap as well as developing a roadmap to an artificial kidney. Um, one thing to think about in terms of artificial kidney is you have to think about it almost like a drug because it is a treatment. Um, so you have to have that mentality of, you know, who is the patient that would receive benefit uh, what is that utility and benefit for that patient? And we've actually seen kind of two different angles uh, which can still be connected. One is improved health outcome as well as an improved quality of life. Hopefully we get both, uh, but those are two areas that we need to kind of work with patients to better understand. Uh, and more importantly, you know, what are the patient preferences for this artificial kidney? You know, <clears throat> there's gonna be a, it, uh, some changes in lifestyle, you know, whether they have to go in for maintenance, um, you know, and what is that willingness in terms of a potential lifestyle burden on both themselves and their care partners? Um, what is their access to maintenance services? You know, is there a place where they can get uh, either, you know, just to get it assessed, whether it's an artificial kidney, uh, whether it needs to be, you know, improved? Um, that's an important part, particularly uh, given that it's going to be something that's going to be potentially implanted or or um, or wearable. Uh, and then understanding the patient preferences, it allows us to understand what are the trade-offs in terms of risks and the benefits. Where are the risks too high that it's it's not worth going down? Um, and where do the benefits outweigh the risks? And, and making sure we have patients tell us what that is. Um, ob obviously, the more practical side is we also have to kind of understand from understanding which patients would, would most benefit, um, the reimbursement and out-of-pocket costs are something that we need to design in almost from the start to make sure that we're not designing artificial kidneys that are just too expensive for either the healthcare system or the patient that has to pay for it or their families. So as, as I mentioned earlier, Kidney X just closed its submissions for the first phase of the Artificial Kidney Prize just in March. Uh, we, we hope to announce the prize winners in September 2021 around a summit. We'll have uh, details about that summit. It's publicly available to attend. Um, in terms of the applications themselves and, and kind of our 
uh, really this first phase was was really to see a, what is the la who is working on what and and how far are they at and really awarding prizes for those that have gone really uh, moved the artificial kidney landscape further. Uh, what we were hoping for were integrated concepts. So we were hoping that we would actually see folks who are developing an artificial kidney, not just part of one. Um, we were hoping for a diversity of approaches. Uh, as I had mentioned, we think the artificial kidney be, can, can be created by a multitude of, of approaches, whether it's mechanical engineering or cellular engineering, um, regenerative medicine, xenotransplant, uh, and others. Um, and we saw quite, quite a diversity of approaches we were excited to see. Um, I think more importantly, we were hoping for multidisciplinary teams, knowing that it's it's going to take a bunch of different scientific sectors to come together to create an artificial kidney, um, and and we saw that. Um, I think one of our last nice to haves was that we'd have international interest, and and as you can see on the right in that map, um, we were able to get applications, some of them from around the world. Um, you can see them highlighted in green. I think some of the smaller ones that you can't see. We're partners uh, coming together from Israel and Singapore. Uh, so we were pretty excited at, at the um, interest as well as the, the broader artificial kidney community. Um, we did receive 31 applications. Again, as I mentioned, several of them were big team approaches. Um, you know, we're, we're right now in the judging and reviewing process and uh, look forward to announcing who the winners are in September 2021. Uh, this will be followed by a second phase uh, and we'll announce uh, the the scope of that second phase also in September of this year uh, with a March 2022 submission date. Again, all of this is to be confirmed. Um, this will be in support of a $6 million total prize purse uh, in which we'll announce the winners uh, exactly a, a year from when we're announcing the first one, September 2022. Um, our goal is really to start aligning what I had mentioned earlier about the kidney health initiatives uh, roadmap on the artificial kidney and, and making sure that we're supporting the goals as well as kind of what was the aspirations of that roadmap. Uh, so I'd like to thank you and everybody for your time. Um, again, our goal on the right is, is to make that future state a lot closer. Uh, we know in order to get there, uh, it will require investments. We'll definitely need patients along the way to not only help design the artificial kidney and other innovations, but also tell us what other innovations are needed. Um, we think, you know, all of the approaches, particularly with artificial kidney, require a multidisciplinary approach. Um, we do look forward to both your insight um, as well as your feedback uh, and your participation. Um, our emails were at that on the last slide. Uh, please uh, reach out to us, either Molly O'Neill, who's the Kidney X coordinator, or myself um, over at ASN's uh, Research Discovery and Innovation. Uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. I have a quick question for you. Based on your background as a professional managing very complex solutions in the federal government and working with a tremendous number of private sector innovators, I'd like you to comment on how you see a global patient consortium that's coming together to drive and support innovation, how that can have an impact on the regulatory and payment landscape long before these devices make themselves uh, available to patients in the marketplace. If you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really good question. Um, in terms of having the patient voice, the, the patients are the ultimate beneficiaries of of all these innovations, whether it's a drug, whether it's uh, artificial kidney, um, and we have to make sure that you know we're meeting the needs of the patient first um, from the beginning, um, and we only understand the patient need by having them tell us uh, and describe to us uh, not only what do they need, um, but how do we get there. Um, particularly with people with kidney diseases, the care partners are also very important. So it's it's not just the the patient themselves, but also their social network. Um, as we look at people with kidney diseases as well, um, there's also a need to understand both also the social network, um, their access to services, uh, their ability to pay, um, or the willingness of payers to to pay for these uh, different options. Um, it's not just telling us what is needed, uh, but it's also important to have the patient voice throughout the whole process to make sure both the innovators are still addressing the patient need um, and not, I'd say, shortcutting the prioritized preferences that, that um, so if, if cost is important, if, uh, if ability to uh, access services uh, from their home is important, 
uh, we have to make sure that these innovations continue to to also address those needs, not just from a biological perspective, but also just uh, I would say both a benefit and uh, an ability to take advantage of these options. And if if we force a patient to significantly change their lifestyle uh, to adopt uh, a new innovation, I'd say we're we're probably starting off on the wrong foot. Thank you very much, Mark. We appreciate your time and the full support of the American Society of Nephrology for our efforts at the American Association of Kidney Patients and for the Global Summit. Our next speaker is Dr. Shuba Roy, who comes to us from the University of California at San Francisco, where he serves as a professor of the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences and Surgery. More importantly, he serves as the head of the Kidney Project where he works alongside Dr. William Fazell of Vanderbilt University on an artificial implantable kidney. He's quite the patient advocate, a very good friend of AAKP, and we actually partnered as an organization with the Kidney Project in 2018 because the American Association of Kidney Patients believes so strongly in the advancements of science and innovation and for a future that includes artificial implantable organs, namely the kidney. Dr. Roy, go right ahead. Thank you, AAKP and George Washington University for the opportunity to provide an update on the Kidney Project. This update will cover some of the recent developments as well as the background on the Kidney Project that has set as its goal the development of a new technology to treat kidney failure. As you can see, our goal is to develop an implantable bioartificial kidney. What is this? This is a compact device that is surgically implanted in the abdomen to provide continuous treatment, and it combines a hemofilter unit to remove toxins from blood with a cell therapy unit which we call the bioreactor, to provide the other primary functions of a healthy kidney. It operates continuously, as I have mentioned. Because it's implanted, there are no external connections. It allows for total freedom of mobility. By avoiding the through skin connections, we minimize the risks of infection from outside. Because the bioreactor has kidney cells, it will provide more physiological therapy than dialysis would. And because the cells are protected inside the device, the patient's immune system and the cells are separated from each other, which means there's no need for immune suppression drugs. And the device can be instrumented with sensors to not only monitor its function, but also report on the status of the patient's health. The idea of the implantable bioartificial kidney is that it would get surgically implanted through a, a surgical procedure, not very different from a kidney transplant, connected to the blood vessels, and then the waste would be directed to the bladder to pass out as urine. And this vision of the bioartificial kidney has driven us over the last decade to advance the technology to make this happen. The work we are doing here is building on the pioneering cell therapy work that was conducted by Dr. Humes at the University of Michigan in the late 90s and early 2000s. What he did was to actually take conventional dialyzer technology, dialyzer filters, dialysis machines, except he connected two of them together to mimic the architecture of the kidney's nephron. The filter to remove the toxins in the kidney is called the glomerulus. Here we call it the hemofilter. Blood comes into the hemofilter, generates ultrafiltrate, which is then directed to the next stage of the device, which we call the bioreactor, which mimics the kidney's tubule. The bioreactor is lined with kidney cells that perform the primary functions that a native kidney does. And these two components together provide more complete renal replacement therapy. 
So we are mimicking the architecture of the device that Dr. Humes developed over two decades ago, but making it available for the larger community that needs to be treated uh, continuously and at home uh, for kidney failure. So this is the fundamental question that we've been working on is how you, do you take the renal cell therapy work that Dr. Humes did, which is being implemented here on the left side of the screen and make it an implanted continuous therapy device for the vast majority of chronic kidney failure patients, which is shown on the right. And this is what we call the kidney project. And that is the effort that has driven our team over the last decade and a half. And the, uh, the approach we are taking is an engineering solution. What I mean by that is that we are taking the known knowledge that's out there and meticulously integrating it, refining it, optimizing it to create a device that can provide therapy. We took this approach because unlike discovery science, which requires elements of chance and requires a lot of fundamental discovery time uh, to get to a meaningful result, we have the engineering solution allows us to bring a talented team together and get to a solution that can provide treatment in a shorter period of time than most discovery science based projects. Here you see a slide of a rover that will go to Mars and a team of engineers and technicians putting it together. It does take time. It does take uh, resources in terms of money, but fundamentally, once it's done, it's going to go to Mars and it's going to work. It's not waiting for a new principle of physics or chemistry to be discovered. And we contrast this to some of the other basic science approaches that may result in a breakthrough, no doubt, but may take a much longer time to get to patients. The fundamental technology we are using to miniaturize the concept of the renal cell therapy device that Dr. Humes demonstrated at the University of Michigan over two decades ago is what we call silicon nanopore membranes. This is a technology that has been adapted from semiconductor microelectronics. The same technology used to make your phones, your laptops, and the like. And you can use this technology to precisely create a new membrane geometry that outperforms the conventional membranes that are used in dialysis today. Because of the precise geometry, you can have a membrane that is highly selective. Toxins from blood, just as your normal kidneys would do it, and it's highly permeable. What that means is that it requires very little energy to achieve that filtration, such that you actually do not need electromechanical pumps. You can run this just off the body's own blood pressure alone. And because it's silicon that can be modified on its surface by surface chemistry techniques, you can make it highly biologically compatible. So this technology, the SNM, as we call it, allows for a biomimetic filter unit that can operate with just the body's own blood pressure without the need for significant uh, energy driving requirements and can be operated for a long time inside the body because it's biocompatible. Now, I will take the opportunity to share a video. This video will showcase some of the research highlights that my team have worked on over the past few years. This video is from the lab of my colleague, Dr. William Fizel at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And it showcases the research work that has to go in 
to the other is the development of an artificial kidney, in this case, both the mechanical filter and the cell therapy unit. Please watch. The future is looking brighter for patients with kidney disease. Not only are new medicines and treatments slowing progression of disease, but new treatments for kidney failure are coming soon as well. Researchers have made breakthrough progress growing kidney cells in the lab for cell therapy of end-stage kidney disease. Long before researchers grow new kidneys in the laboratory or transplant them from animals into people, a combination of cutting-edge nanotechnology and living kidney cells will free patients from the tether of dialysis and provide the benefits of kidney transplant to everyone with kidney failure. Let's see how this universal donor kidney works. Kidneys filter the blood to separate wastes from healthy blood and then concentrate wastes from the whole body into one to two liters of urine each day. The biohybrid kidney does exactly the same thing, unlike dialysis with its heavy machines and batteries and gallons of water, which can never be implanted. The cells that make up the kidney's filter are extraordinarily fragile and leakiness of the kidney's filters underlies almost all of the kidney disease that results in kidney failure and the need for dialysis. Those cells are exceptionally fragile. They do not grow in the dish. So Dr. Fizel and his team designed a new kind of artificial filtration membrane based on the size and shape of healthy kidney cells. This membrane is the first completely new technology in renal replacement in over 25 years. The collaboration with Dr. Shuvo Roy allowed this idea to progress from concept to FDA application. However, it's not just the kidney's filter cells that misbehave. Most human cells really don't look or act in a lab dish the same way they do in a healthy person. The tubule cells that concentrate wastes from the whole body into a little bit of urine don't reabsorb salt and water and don't excrete toxins when grown in an artificial environment. This isn't just a problem for artificial kidneys. Drug companies can't use cells in a dish to test for efficacy or toxicity and medical doctors have to use entire animals to examine mechanisms of disease and effect of treatments. Solving the problem of cell culture stress solves many problems. Dr. Fizel felt that part of the problem was that cell culture was vastly different to a healthy body. Plastic lab dishes are hard, human tissues are soft, kidney cells have fluid flowing over them, cells in a dish are still. We culture kidney cells with serum, but in the body, the cells don't really get exposed to serum. Dr. Fizel started testing these simple factors one by one and in combination. Testing these factors, it's like a centipede driving a bus. If there's 75 feet on the brake pedal and you take one foot off, the bus still doesn't go forward. The cells certainly look different on soft materials than on hard plastic, but they didn't seem to reflect these changes in the proteins they expressed, the key proteins. Enter serendipity. Rachel Evans runs the cell culture in Dr. Fizel's lab, and she had tested one batch of cells seated on soft materials to see if they were making proteins to reabsorb sodium, and they were not. However, she had kept a second batch of cells to test if something went wrong with the first tests. She kept changing the cell culture medium on them until a few more weeks had gone by far longer than most people grow this kind of cell in the lab. She ran the test again on these cells that had been in the dish for weeks, and the cells had started to make the sodium exchanger proteins a basic function of natural kidney cells. From there, the team went on to examine the signaling pathways that governed the response to soft versus stiff materials. By manipulating those pathways with drugs, they were able to coax the cells into pumping salt and water just like they do in a kidney. From the start of the project, we have tried to improve on what we accomplish to strive every day for a better life for patients with kidney failure. 70 years ago, we treated polio with an iron lung, but medical advances have put the iron lung out of the clinic and in a museum. And we strive to do the exact same thing for dialysis machines. I hope you saw 
the range of disciplines, the amount of work it takes to build components of the bioartificial kidney. In this slide, I focus on just the mechanical part. You may recall the little silicon membrane that was referenced in the video. Here, we are now talking about moving it, moving it from a small filter unit towards something that would get closer to patients. On the top left, you'll see a photograph of a mini prototype of a filter. And on the right-hand side is a schematic showing where blood goes in and out and where the ultrafiltrate comes out. And we have spent time to design, optimize this device so that it can be operated in, pre, in the benchtop and preclinical settings. Here, we've actually implanted that device into this animal and you see a catheter sticking out. So we can test the performance of the filter after implantation. We ran that filter through a dialysis machine on the outside. Note, the filter is already implanted. The little tubing that you see is the catheter that goes to the dialysis machine. And we are able to run dialysis in this animal over the course of a few days. Some key points, there was no external blood pump. There was no ex blood outside the body, but we're able to perform hemodialysis. We did not need to use systemic anticoagulation like heparin. The design of our filter and the coatings of the filter are optimized such that the blood flows without causing uh, thrombi or blood clots. And as such, when it was not connected to the machine, the pig, in this case, was able to move uh, freely and drink freely. And what you see on the right is the data over the course of three days. And you should note there's no loss of albumin, no loss of protein over those three days. We did have a urea and creatinine uh, clearance that is so comparable to commercial dialyzer filters. But again, we did not use a blood pump. And there's a slight decrease on the third day uh, on, for clearance. This is very exciting for us because it shows us that we can make a filter that can operate just under the body's own blood pressure without systemic anticoagulation and provide toxin removal from blood, making us excited that we can build the hemofilter component of the artificial, bioartificial kidney. So next we looked at the cell therapy unit, which we call the bioreactor. You see a schematic of the bioreactor on the left and being implanted on the right. And what you're seeing in the middle are the cells that are put into the bioreactor. Each of the little gray squares that you see on the right-hand side are human kidney cells that are isolated from a cadaver kidney and grown in culture and then inserted into this bioreactor device. We put the bioreactor device um, into the animal and closed up the animal. And the cells in the bioreactor were kept in the animal for three days. In this case, we implanted the bioreactor in the region in the neck so we could monitor any potential complications uh, readily via ultrasound. And what you see on the right is the cells have grown and are alive after three days of implantation. Why is that exciting? We've actually put human kidney cells in our device and implanted that into a pig. And we did not need any immunosuppression drugs. If we did that without the, our device, all the cells that we had in, would implant would die because the human cells and the pig's immune system would reject them. But our membrane has the capacity to provide 
immunoprotection. And by protecting the cells, you can avoid the need for the anti-rejection drugs. And just like the hemofilter, we again did not need heparin or other anticoagulant drugs, and the device operated just under the pig's own blood pressure. So we now have taken the advances that we've learned from the filter by itself and the advances we've learned from the bioreactor by itself. And now we have embarked on the next stage in our journey. That is to integrate the filter unit with the bioreactor unit. What you see here is one of our first prototypes showing the filter and the bioreactor integrated together into a prototype implantable bioartificial kidney. The top half is the filter, the bottom half is the bioreactor. And there's silicon membranes, the SNM, and the cells to provide both filtration and cell therapy. I should stress, this is a prototype and it's a miniscale prototype. It does not have enough membrane area or enough cells to provide sufficient treatment for a kidney patient yet. So there's more work to be done, but it shows that we can actually build them and integrate them together. Here we show the timeline of the kidney project from early stage conceptualization in the early 2000s, where we basically looked at the work that was done with the external renal assist device, the renal cell therapy device. We developed the silicon membrane technology and showed its proof of concept. And then we moved into preclinical uh, work and optimization where we deconstructed the project into a bioreactor development portion and a hemofilter development portion. And you can see for the bioreactor, we took in three key tasks. And for the hemofilter, we took on five key tasks that were successfully completed um, last decade. And now we are finishing up the bioreactor and moving into the integration phase. It is not trivial to integrate, but we'll have to integrate the two components and also scale up the device. What does that mean? It means we have to put sufficient cells and sufficient membranes to provide renal replacement therapy. It's not discovery science, it's engineering optimization. It does take time and there will inevitably be areas we need to refine our work, but we are very hopeful that these are all tractable issues. Once we've shown that we can integrate the device in a, and provide therapy to a preclinical model that has compromised kidney function, then we can move on to thinking about the first human tests. I showed this slide and also pointed out their challenges. One has been the unusual past year of the pandemic. It has impacted our supply chain. It has impacted the pace of progress. And we are very fortunate that now we're beginning to come out of that and ramping up the pace of our work. We're also challenged by the need for funds. This work is obviously meaningful to many of the patient community, many of the physician community. Unfortunately, we are not at the stage that we are readily accessible to the investor community because they feel like we need to develop our technology further and demonstrate its feasibility in humans. But we are also challenged by being further out than the basic science proof of concept, which is where traditionally research projects get their grant funding either from NIH or National Science Foundation. So we try to work creatively with funding agencies, with donors, with patient groups like AAKP to 
encourage the uh, resources to come to projects like ours so we can get this done and completed and advance towards patients in the coming years. I will end by saying that the progress we've made to date is due to a number of resources and people. So we have received early stage funding from the National Institutes of Health and other federal agencies. We've been fortunate to also been able to attract foundation funding and also donors, small dollar donors to some larger dollar donors that have continued to support us to move the project forward. But we need to be able to get this done. To get this done, my colleague, Dr. William Fizel, shown on the top right, and I encourage all members of the AAKP community to reach out to the various stakeholders and encourage them to support mechanisms that allow us to complete the development of the implantable bioartificial kidney. We have a great team. I encourage you to check out our website and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy. AAKP enjoys our partnership with the Kidney Project and your longtime support for our efforts here at the Global Summit and as the nation's largest kidney patient organization. Our next speaker is Dr. Vic Gura. And Dr. Gura is the founder of the Wearable Artificial Kidney, or WALK. He is also coming to us from Cedar sinai Hospital, where he has directly treated kidney patients and knows full well the burden of kidney disease on individuals and their families. And this is why he has been a champion and an innovator of artificial wearable organs and artificial wearable kidneys. Dr. Gurr understands that treatments must align with the aspirations of patients. And that's why he has taken so much of his personal time and resources and invested them in solutions that are tailored for patients. Dr. Gurr is joining us by video in a rebroadcast of a presentation that he gave to AAKP late last year. This broadcast has been extremely popular with patients around the world, and it provokes some pretty interesting questions about the feasibility of wearable kidneys, how patients are demanding solutions that are not in a dialysis center, and the great work that's being done by engineers and modelers around the world in efforts similar to Dr. Gurr's to try to bring this solution to bear for patients. Dr. Gurr, go right ahead. I would like to uh, thank AAKP and uh, the University of George W. Uh, AAKP is a wonderful organization and it's a very uh, good channel for all the patients uh, to have some say or some organized input uh, on the uh, issues that are affecting them and the rest of the nephrology community. So uh, I think uh, that uh, the folks that uh, take the time uh, and their efforts to do that are doing a fantastic job. I also uh, want to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Raj Dominic uh, from the University of Washington for uh, his leadership in doing a great organization and a great nephrology division. Uh, let's get started now uh, with my disclosures. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, a wearable artificial kidney, why do we need it? How does it work? Does it really do the job? Uh, and those are the main questions I will uh, ask, I'll try to answer. Why do we need it? Uh, when I'm in a room telling a patient uh, that dialysis is necessary, uh, it's a very difficult time for me, uh, for the patient and the families, uh, your uh, friends that are around, hopefully, uh, in, in this difficult situation. And the questions that usually can, uh, come up are, what can I expect? How long do I have before I'm gone? Does it hurt? Can I work? Do I need help? Who's going to pay for this? And my answers, the answers of any practicing nephrology for these questions, are unfortunately not very good. So uh, what are the unmet needs in dialysis and what are we trying to accomplish? We want to reduce the mortality, improve the quality of life, reduce the cost, improve access to the technology and make 
life and uh, cares more simple because it's a quite complicated endeavor uh, that inconvenience the life of the patients when they have to start doing this. So here is a list of all the many problems that affect the life of a patient when they are on the on dialysis uh, with the, uh, uh, sitting on the chair doing time, the pill burden of swallowing a large amount of pills, uh, fluid restriction, if they drink too much we have to remove a lot, if we remove a lot they cramp, if we don't remove enough they choke with water in their lungs, they go a lot to the hospital, uh, most of the patients on dialysis uh, are fatigued, are disabled and cannot hold the job and be gainfully employed and most of them have problems with even doing their activities of daily life. So uh, these are things we want to solve uh, in a wonderful uh, document called the uh, Roadmap for Improvements on Dialysis that has been developed in the community. Uh, these issues are clearly stated and are the uh, guidance of we need to solve these things. And uh, I can tell you here now that the WAC uh, solves uh, most if not all of this are quite successful uh, and I hope I will make that point now. Uh, in the roadmap uh, we want to uh, have a uh, improved volume control, no sodium retention, less hypertension, no hyperkalemia, no uh, metabolic acidosis, improved serum albumin, improved sleep patterns, uh, we want to uh, reduce or eliminate the need for pills and phosphate binders, improve appetite and nutrition, decrease need for blood pressure drugs, and decrease morbidity and mortality. Well, this was written by a kidney doctor. But if you ask the patients, the order in which these things uh, are spelled out is a little different. Uh, patients will want more quality of life. Uh, they want... Uh, they care more about how they live whatever time they have than uh, not necessarily how long they have. We have to respect that as uh, kidney doctors, uh, but the idea is that as a physician, I confess that's what I am, uh, I believe that if we address these issues, uh, each one of them, when it gets solved, then quality of life improves. And I'll, I'll discuss that a, a little bit further. So lately people say, well, why don't we do this at home? And if we do it at home, uh, people will be better off. And um, if we uh, also would uh, dialyze more frequently uh, longer, uh, we can uh, improve quality of life. But the way uh, dialysis is structured today, uh, you simply cannot do more dialysis if, unless you're doing it at home. And uh, if you live in Beverly Hills with uh, five bedrooms and two people, uh, you can definitely put uh, more than one machine in your house. But if we are five people in two bedrooms, then it becomes a little, becomes a little bit more complicated. So uh, those of us that sit around saying, oh, we have to do more dialysis at home, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, it's simply uh, not doable to the extent that uh, the powers to be and the organizations want us to because the technology doesn't allow it. You need more rooms, you need more space, you need the uh, water. Um, uh, many people want uh, somebody to assist them because the technology is a uh, is complicated or because they don't feel very well uh we're doing it and they want somebody around and we don't have enough nurses and technicians and uh, if we want to expand uh, the um, the uh, amount of dialysis uh, chairs available in dialysis units uh, there is no uh, political or budgetary uh, ability uh, to simply double the amount of dialysis clinics that we have so people can come more open. 
let alone the fact that patients don't even want to go to uh, more often to a dialysis unit to begin with. They want their life back to do what they want to do instead of sitting around in, uh, in a chair. So we said, well, how can we solve this? And I've shown this slide many times and uh, forgive me for being repetitive, but this makes the point. Uh, if we dialyze, a comp if we uh, miniaturize things like uh, the clock to the wristwatch uh, and the big uh, uh, computer to a more powerful device that is in the palm of your hand with a smartphone, we should convert a big machine that weighs a couple of hundred pounds uh, is a, uh, operated with a, an electrical outlet and requires 40 gallons of water per treatment into something that people walk around with. So we did that. And uh, we went from a uh, the large machine to a belt that uh, you could walk around with and work on batteries. So this belt worked with a uh, blood in red that comes uh, through a pump into the dialyzer and then in blue it goes back into the patient. Uh, the dialysate in green goes into the dialyzer, comes out in yellow. It's uh, regenerated and purified through those yellow circles that contain chemicals that cleans the, dialy the dialysate and it keeps going in a loop. This way, instead of using 40 gallons of water, we went to 300 cc's and this was the diagram of the WAC in its second version, version 2.0. This is version 1 uh, that was trialed in an animal in Cedar sinai uh, This is version 2 and the first human trial was done in Italy with Professor Ronco in blue. Uh, and in the middle, you have a patient uh, that was strolling in the park. Uh, and um, uh, this is a little park uh, in the Vicenza Hospital uh, where Professor uh, Ronco works. And uh, in the slide above, uh, in the picture above, in your right, you can see mother and daughter both on dialysis. Mother with a, a regular dialysis machine like we have today and a daughter with the version 2.0 of the uh, wearable artificial kidney. The second human trial was done in uh, the United Kingdom uh, and uh, we have uh, patients that uh, are wearing the device and walking around. Uh, with the tie on there is the late uh, Hans Dietrich Polaschek, a most gifted engineer that mentored us and helped us a lot to bring the WAC to where it is today. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Andrew Davenport, uh, the gentleman with the uh, butterfly tie. And uh, he uh, was another uh, great mentor and collaboration that we are very successful to collaborate with. And then uh, we did the first FDA trial uh, in Seattle uh, with the help of uh, Jonathan Himmelfarb and a wonderful team in University of Washington. And here is the first uh, human being, uh, first human beings in the United States and the first woman in the United States uh, uh, dancing with a wearable artificial kidney while getting dialysis, not sitting in a chair, not attached to anything. And this is the WAC 2.0. So this is the WAC 2.0. And when we use it, uh, patients told us it's too heavy. It's 11 pounds. It's still not small enough. And uh, although we were very happy with the lady uh, in the blue box in the, in the bottom, in the sense that uh, we proved that the concept is doable, but there were still ways to go because patients were still not willing to walk around uh, with this device and, and, uh, and move around. So we learned in London that our, uh, in eight hours, we removed uh, all the uh, uh, toxin uh, indicators uh, that we needed to remove quite efficiently in eight hours. 
and uh, we removed enough urea and creatinine uh, over eight hours. So we said, well, if we can do this over eight hours, uh, why do we need uh, more equipment to keep removing this over 24? So we went back to the drawing board and we said, we're going to have a day version in which we remove the heavy components uh, that uh, you can see uh, here on the, uh, uh, on the bottom. And uh, we went uh, from 11 pounds to two pounds. To that end, we also had to improve uh, the uh, device uh, on your left is the old uh, WAC pump from the version 2.0 that gave us a lot of technical problems. So uh, we kept going to the um, uh, version uh, 3 and that in the middle is pump 3 of 18 pumps we kept building and improving until we came to what you see on the right hand side where we have a, uh, the latest version of the WAC pump, which is fundamentally different from what we had in the 2.0. And uh, it showed us, gave us a lot of advantages uh, in, uh, in, in how the uh, device performs. So going to the drawing board, we said, okay, uh, how do we make this uh, smaller and more convenient for the patient? So this is one of the several sketches that we're starting to re redo the work from the 2.0 to the 3.0. And uh, we came up with a version, a daily version that you, you wear around during the day. It weighs two, point, uh, two pounds only, but it has a, um, a blood coming from uh, the uh, patient from the catheter into the dialyzer and going back and the dial dialysate goes into one uh, canister of sorbents and then it goes back to the uh, to the dialyzer in a circle and this bag that contains the extra fluid that is removed is out of the bed and uh, we'll show you what happens when this is outside of the belt but still hooked up so during the night the belt hooks up uh, to uh, the three containers of, uh, of chemicals that uh, do the job that needs to be done in eight hours. So these three guys uh, work over eight hours uh, to do what they need to do. Thanks to the new pump, uh, our uh, rate of removal uh, of fluids is going to be much more effective. And then we started to play around with different models uh, on how this is going to look, looking at different things that people put on their own bodies. We looked at the uh, belts that people put things in, uh, and we even looked at a dialysis patients that hopefully might have a wearable kidney uh, on a backpack and go fishing. Uh, I do not believe that the 3.0 will allow you to do that. Uh, maybe another iteration but at least I want you to know that we were thinking of how we do uh, return to the patients in normal life where you can go fishing if you want to. Uh, you can go, uh, I'm not sure I can uh, bring the work to scuba diving uh, with it, with the work on, but that doesn't mean uh, we cannot try. And we look at different models of things that people put in their bodies to carry things. Uh, from a holster to carry a gun, uh, to uh, uh, vests that can be worn in the field. Uh, and uh, we even uh, looked at different possibilities as where in the body you put what. And at all times, what we wanted is to give patients normalcy on how to do things. So we did, we did mock of, a mock of the work in its version 3.0. And here we have one of our beloved designers. This is Lance, who did a fantastic job, and you'll see that. And we look, how can we give normalcy so you can move around, walk around with this, 
hopefully wear it under your shirt uh, so it's not obvious for people to see this many patients have expressed that they don't want to be seen uh, with the device on their body walking around and people pointing fingers we have to respect that so with that in mind uh, we work a lot to see how we can uh, make it this not only light but discreet to allow normalcy and we try to figure out where do we put what so i told you that the waste bag with the pump that puts the waste into that bag are out of the belt so they hook up here but they can go in your pocket or in a table when you don't want to remove fluids so this gives to the patients uh, the ability to remove fluid if and when they want to so uh, it, it gives uh, flexibility and choices uh, to how to do this and I'll explain that uh, about the choices a little bit further so this is uh, one model, mock model that we produced with our designers of how the wearable will go. And you may notice that the parts are to the sides. So uh, the uh, person wearing this can bend forward uh, without the impediment of this uh, things in their belly. And uh, we do need some suspenders so this doesn't fall. And you may notice that the catheter with blood uh, even though it's placed in the chest like usually it's tunneled under the skin and goes and exits here so you don't have a line of blood uh, that can get entangled with things and then you can open this and remove components uh, as we would train the patients to do and this is very easy so it doesn't need a lot of manual dexterity or issues. And uh, the fluid removal uh, is done by a little pump with a bag. And you can roll the bag when it's empty and put this in your pocket. Now, uh, if you uh, have a, uh, an elder uh, patient uh, in, a, in a nursing home, it doesn't really matter too much. But if you're working in your office, uh, you can hook this thing up here and remove fluid. Uh, then you want to go to Starbucks, you unhook this. The bag is now full. You go to the bathroom, empty the bag. You have your coffee and this is not hooked up. So you have less weight on you and you can go to the bank or to your Starbucks or to walk in the park. And then you come back to your office and you hook this back and keep removing fluid. So it gives patients choices on, uh, according to their lifestyle. If you have an elder patient uh, in, in, a, uh, in a nursing home, probably doesn't matter too much. But if you're an active person that wants to have a significant life and do significant work, uh, then this is a great advantage. Uh, this is an elder patient in this modeling uh, that hooks up the night module during the night when he is asleep. But this lovely guy is here watching TV, removing fluid uh, when he's at home. And then when he decides that he needs to take his uh, stroll in the park or uh, go to the bank, he takes this off. And when he comes back home, he removes fluid again. And for the purpose of showing you this, we have to do it uh, above the shirt, but we will strive to make it small enough so it goes under the t-shirt under the dress under the garment so they don't have to uh, uh, be exposed uh, to uh, other people noticing this if they don't want to people may choose to uh, wear the device like this and it allows a quite significant amount of activity uh, for uh, elder patients uh, you can, if you're younger enough and you hold the, uh, your, um, your work under your, um, uh, under your t-shirt, as opposed to above the t-shirt, but if it would be under your t-shirt, you wouldn't see this. And, uh, you know, you can go and, uh, take a hike, so to speak.
and at night you can put it uh, with a, a night module inside a pillow or a teddy bear and uh, what are the advantages that we have for uh, these patients i mean so okay it looks nice does it do the job so uh this is a table that would take me a, a long time uh to uh, uh to discuss but the advantages is that we remove enough fluid so patients can drink whatever they want whenever they want and uh, we can remove it they can eat all the salt they want because this thing removes enough salt so you can add salt uh, to have a normal meal uh we have shown in all the trials we've done so far that we remove enough phosphorus to move uh, to make uh, phosphate binders obsolete so you don't need phosphate binders and this has uh, more than one profound effect and if you don't have fluid overload and you don't have a salt overload uh, it stands to reason that they uh, will not have swelling of the legs shortness of breath pulmonary edema and go less to the hospital uh you don't need needles that are painful and most patients i know don't enjoy getting two thick needles uh, stuck in their arms at all times uh so uh those are some of the uh, many advantages of this device so patients can eat whatever they want this lady was wearing uh, the uh, walk in Seattle that she could eat pizza, french fries and drink cola to her heart's content. Uh, this is a trial of WAC 2.0 and you can eat a banana or cheesecake. Uh, this uh, lovely guy is walking around eating whatever he wanted and no need for phosphate binders. Uh, let's talk about money. As stated by our good friend Eli Friedman, uh, the world cannot afford end-stage uh, renal disease. It's unsustainable. And some of the uh, economic advantages of the, of the device we're bringing uh, in front of you is uh, savings of whatever. The last time we, we looked at this is already close to six and a half billion a year in just making a uh, phosphate binders obsolete uh, the charges for phosphate binders are about 900 dollars per month and if you do the math today you go uh, to six and a half billion in savings just in making one drug alone obsolete so uh, we would have uh, less uh, uh, hospitalizations, less hypertension, less cardiovascular disease, no phosphate binders, and a numerous amount of economic advantages with this device. So this lady would be wearing this under her shirt. And we went from uh, uh, where dialysis is today to the 2.0 to what we would like uh, to see in the future uh, and this is what we are doing not in the distant future this is what we're building as we speak uh, hopefully the trial of the device uh, similar to what you see in this picture will occur still this year and uh, this is not a uh, the brainchild of Victor Gura there are numerous uh, excellent scientists technicians nurses physicians that have been collaborating uh, over a very long pathway uh, to bring this to where we are today. And this is my time to thank them and you for listening. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today who spoke to the issue of artificial implantable and wearable kidneys. The fact is that innovations are happening here in the U.S. and around the world. And this is very important for those who have been impacted by kidney disease and especially those who face kidney failure. Not everyone is eligible for a kidney transplant and far too many people wait on the organ donor list, waiting their lives for a kidney to become available. But for these people who are suffering and for their families, it's very important that innovation move forward and that we bring artificial organs to the forefront and make them accessible in the consumer market. 
the individuals that you just heard from are some of the leaders of that effort. And we are quite proud as AAKP and George Washington University to be working so closely with them and to have them here today with us at the Global Summit. Thank you.